All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us from different parts of the world. And uh, Eid Mubarak for all those who, you know, celebrated uh, the Ramadan. Uh, as you might know by now, my name is Matteo Capasso. I am the editor of uh, Middle East Critique. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the, the University of Venice in Italy and Columbia University, which right now is the theater of a major uh, shit show, I think it's the right word. Uh, as a journal, uh, as Middle East Critique, and as an editor of the journal, together with the other members of the editorial board, we decided to launch this uh, open pedagogical initiative called Ramadan Course on Palestine and Imperialism. Just for some grounding, I know most of us, by most of you by now know this, but for also for those who are watching us later on YouTube, uh, it has been uh, seven months since the beginning of the genocide of the Palestinian people in Gaza, and there are different reasons why we decided to offer this open course. The course has been put together uh, at the very start as an initiative in support of the people of Palestine and their call of a global wave of action during Ramadan and after, where people from all walks of life dedicate their time and abilities to end the genocide happening in Gaza and supporting the resistance to this. As academics, scholars and activists, we decided that our abilities could be put at the service of this global wave of action by organizing an educational platform that is accessible to the general public, even more so in light of the silence and censoring of uh, academics and students as it's happening right now in Italy, in, uh, in the US as well, within public and private educational institutions that have been simply trying to speak logically on this issue. Second, the course does not focus simply on Palestine, but it purposely aims to connect the Palestinian question with the question of imperialism, because there have been many initiatives, teachings, educational initiatives and books being written on Palestine, but we think that most of them tend to dilute and water down the role that US-led imperialism has played in the region for decades. And now this core issue is inevitable to be faced and to be analyzed when we want to think of the about the question of national liberation in Palestine. The course is also meant to ground us in a broader understanding of the political thought and geopolitical changes uh, the region has witnessed. And uh, in doing so, we invited scholars from various fields to explain the enduring relevance and intellectual necessity of picking up the philosophical tradition anchored in historical materialism to revisit these unprecedented events that we're witnessing today, but also to understand the strategies needed to move forward, both to analyze, but also to, you know, again, to walk our path of life in support of Palestinian national liberation. Today, we're going to have a beautiful session which followed the last one, the one from last week with uh, Louis Olday and Bikram Gill. Today, I have the pleasure to have with me two colleagues and comrades with whom we've been really trying to make sense of things since uh, October 7th. We launched different initiatives, which I will share in the chat. Uh, the structure of the session today, we're going to have two presentations, first with Justin and then Alex. So, And then we're going to open up for the Q&A. But as they go into their presentation, I immediately, you know, like want to encourage everybody who's joined the webinar to already start writing questions in the in the Q and A space, so that we can then ask our esteemed speakers. I would start with uh, Justin. Justin Pudu runs the Anti Empire Project podcast and YouTube channel, including the Gaza War Sea Trap series and the civilizational uh, Civilizations Historical series and the Tanky Therapy one. Uh, which I will all show, I will all uh, put up the link in the chat, is the author of a beautiful book, Siege Breakers, a 2019 speculative novel where Palestinians win a war of liberation. He's been to Gaza and the West Bank and was a volunteer with the International Solidarity Movement in 2002. Justin has been also, you know, uh, working in his uh, Gaza war sit traps a lot with Electronic Intifada member John Elmer. Justin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo. Thank you to the whole team for putting on this series. I've been watching um, the course as it's unfolded with all the 
um, instructors and and I've really appreciated uh, benefited from being a student in the class but now uh, I'm a guest instructor uh, myself so I'm, I'm really happy to be part of that I'm really uh, happy to have my name up there with the rest of you guys so I want to make some general notes about armed struggle and um, why it happens and what what we can what how, how we can use some general concepts and notions of armed struggle to understand what's unfolding in Gaza, in Palestine, in that whole region today. So in um, the theories of armed struggle that left wing people like I'm assuming uh, everyone here is making a bit of an assumption about the audience, I think. Uh, but to make that assumption, uh, we have a, a left wing tradition, a communist tradition and a Marxist tradition of armed struggle going back um, at least to the uh, Russian Revolution, maybe a little bit before. But the idea of arm of armed struggle as being part of political struggle, as being uh, inseparable from the context of the political economy, the society, um, national struggles, and international struggles, as analyzed by people like Lenin, who was analyzing the causes of World War One, or or Trotsky, um, who had that analysis of of the Red Army, you know, when he was working in the Red Army during the Civil War. Um, the, uh, you know, Stalin, all of these theorists, all of these people who put uh, armed struggle into practice in the Soviet context, but then uh, in the era of decolonization, we have many examples from Africa, we have many examples from Latin America, which I'll leave to my colleague, Dr. Avinia, um, and we have many examples from Asia, uh, notably Mao Zedong, uh, General Van Gap uh, in Vietnam. So some of the notes, um, just okay, so all of which is to say armed struggle is in this tradition understood to be the hardest the most difficult, the most decisive form of struggle available. There are other, many other ways that class and national struggle can unfold. But if if it's a difficult and intractable conflict, it's going to end up in an armed struggle. Um, and an armed struggle, as I mentioned already, encompasses military, economic, ideological, intellectual, even psychological dimensions. And theorists have added all of these layers. Now, to before I can get to the notion of how to apply these concepts to the struggle in the Middle East, there is a kind of a set of cobwebs that I wanted to clear about that I've been writing about and studying for some years now, which is a kind of idea of a Western-led solidarity strategy that could liberate Palestine nonviolently. And the notion of that strategy is as follows. You have um, people in the global north, which is, according to this theory, the most important arena of struggle, the most decisive arena of struggle is the global north. And therefore, you have to use the civil society, democratic, uh, free speech that is available in the global north to produce a set of discourses and a set of nonviolent actions to win over the elites, the politicians, the decision makers, uh, maybe the celebrities, maybe some of those important media figures, and influence them through these, the, these nonviolent actions, through these nonviolent discourses and lobbying. And once, once you've turned enough of those elites uh, against whatever project they're pursuing, then they will change course. And for example, any whatever the objective is, whether it's an end to the war in Vietnam or an end to the war in Iraq or an end to or freedom for Palestinians, a two-state solution, that's the strategy to pursue. And I would say that that is probably a, a belief system that most Westerners still continue to hold. And if if you go out to rallies, 
if you go out and organize in the Palestine movement, you will encounter this um, belief system. And if there's an Israel lobby, then there can be a counter lobby. Um, and the 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 problem the problem with this there's several problems with this whole uh, belief system. One is that historically it doesn't hold up, and I've been uh, you know I'm not going to go go through all of the evidence here, but I've written this. I've, I'm in the middle of writing. I've written two out of a series of three articles about this. Um, one, you know, the big proofs, the big examples of nonviolent struggle that are given are the civil rights movement in the U.S. and the Indian independence movement. And the first two articles I wrote in the series show that both of those processes were full of violence, including organized armed struggle for many decades. Um, so there's just no historical basis for claiming that those were uh nonviolent struggle. They had a couple of non they had a couple of extremely charismatic, extremely important nonviolent oriented leaders, Martin Luther King in the US and Gandhi in India, but that does not they were not they were only a part of the struggle and there was a gigantic iceberg of violent armed struggle and the, these were the visible tips of that um of that so historically speaking, it never happened. But there's another, there's another major issue with this Western-led strategy, which is when you look at these dimensions, the military, the economic, the ideological, the intellectual, and the psychological. When you have a, a belief system that says, we're not going to touch any of these, because to do so would be a form of violence, you have guaranteed um, the ineffectiveness of this strategy from the beginning. Even no, the nonviolent strategy as of um, boycott, divestment, sanctions, BDS, which is very well known in this movement, even that is considered violence by the people who would police the boundaries of this movement. So when you say, you know, when you say we're going to adopt this nonviolent strategy, we're going to only make a discourse that's acceptable to our enemies, then you give them the initiative to decide which elements of the discourse are acceptable and which are not. And they, to, you know, yesterday it was something, you know, <laughs> it was uh, calling Zionism racism. Uh, today it's BDS. Tomorrow it'll be something else. Whatever, whatever it is that uh, a movement like this uses will be declared out of bounds by the enemy that we are supposed to win over according to this strategy. And so anything that you do that might be too aggressive, that might be too too clear, might be too strong, well, that might alienate the very people that you're trying to win over, which is the important people, which is the Westerners. The other thing is the psychological element of this whole strategy, of non this whole nonviolent Western-led strategy, actually encourages the, the very white supremacist racial supremacist thinking that underpins Zionism in this case um, and, and Israel's strategy. Because you're basically saying, you're basically coming to them as a supplicant and you're saying, please, we accept your mastery and we accept your superiority. We're just asking that you grant us this uh, and we will, in return, we will, uh, we will not threaten any of your interests. We will um, keep everything within the bounds that are set by you. And that's why even in a recent speech, uh, Nasrallah, the secretary general of the Lebanese resistance group, Hezbollah, said that this whole lobby discourse is uh, meant to entrap Arabs in pay giving money to Western politicians so that they could uh, try in the, ho in the hopes that they're one day going to influence, have the same influence with politicians that pro-Israel does. They never will but the politicians will be happy to take their money and take their resources from them uh, while they continue along the same course. Okay, so now let's just turn to some elements from, If uh, I, I'll just assume that you agreed with me and that I've convinced you on all of this and, and that we're back to the idea that armed struggle is the highest or most decisive or um, most severe form of struggle and necessary in this case uh, of genocide. So 
to take just a couple of examples from the past, and then um, we'll just talk a little bit about where things are at with the resistance strategy and uh, and where where how do how we should think about it. Okay, so in terms of Mao and General Giab, the idea of armed struggle against a vastly an opponent with superior technology, an opponent with superior firepower, which was the case in both of these Asian liberation struggles. Um, and both of these figures who theorized, they wrote books about uh, armed struggle and guerrilla warfare. Uh, they talked about a couple of things, a couple of themes emerge. I'd encourage you to read these books if you haven't already, but um, one of them is the importance of mobilizing the whole society. Um, another is the importance of people knowing why they're fighting, the idea that there's an organizational and an ideological preparation in addition to the preparation of the our actual armed struggle and the procurement of weapons and the training and the deployment of weapons and so on. But there's much more that that also to use the to return to the iceberg analogy, that is just the tip of the iceberg below that is why you're fighting um, how you understand the problem of organization, what kind of society you are trying to achieve. All of those are are the iceberg and armed the armed part is just the the tip of the iceberg. Um, the other there's another notion that both that comes through very strongly in all of these, and I think Alex will probably mention this too because it's it's very important in Che Guevara's theorizing of guerrilla warfare, which is that the each guerrilla, each individual uh, soldier has to be an exemplary human being. So they have to be reading all the time. They have to be thinking all the time. They have to be social. They have to be the kind of person every kid wants to grow up to be, uh, which I think we are definitely seeing in the Palestinian um, case uh, in the resistance uh, struggle. So all of these are, are really important elements that I think apply regardless of almost regardless of context. Um, and that's why they're of value as kind of theoretical concepts. Um, so now the armed struggle uh, in this region, in the so-called Middle East region, has a long history. Um, too. So in the 60s, the 70s, there were a series of wars against Israel um, and you know, I've I've covered these a lot in the sit reps. I've read a lot about these, um, and it's just it's interesting to see. For example, one of the Egyptian commanders in the 1973 war, Shazli, he wrote a book called "The Arab Military Option" in the 1980s, and uh, it's it's interesting the way that he talks about it because he says he says some of these things. He says there's no political. We're not going to win anything by negotiating if we can't win it in battle. They're not gonna give us things in uh, by negotiating. They're just gonna take things away if we negotiate. So the military option has to be an option. We have to understand it. We have to prepare for it, even if we can't do it this generation. He's basically like talking about it in the long term, but he kind of does a breakdown by country. And it's interesting because at one point he says, and Lebanon of course is too small. Lebanon can, Lebanon's not gonna amount to anything in terms of resistance to Israel. Uh, but, you know, we can hope that they are not a, a route for invading um, other other Arab countries. So I just thought, you know, it's, it was not a bad prediction to make at the time. But I guess, uh, you know, things it's also proof that history works very differently from um, the way the best predictions that are available decades before. And uh, that also takes me to the final two points that I want to make, which is one about so what in this context of trying to understand warfare and guerrilla warfare from a you know Marxist uh, political economy kind of concept, what is what do we how do we understand the axis of resistance strategy? Um, and they've been quite explicit about it. You may have seen something circulating by Nasrallah where he says, you know, there is a possibility of freeing Palestine without even having a war. Imagine a situation, this is more or less is from memory, but it's more or less he's he's giving an interview and it's it was a, quite some time ago, his hair is black and he's, he's, uh, he's very relaxed and he says, you know, imagine the US is occupied elsewhere, 
um imagine uh the settlers just you know don't see any victor any chance of of staying there that their life becomes kind of intolerable and individually a little at a time they leave and he says you know this is not a fantasy this is not something that uh, that we're dreaming of this is something that is a real one of several real possibilities that that could happen and you know that's something that they say over and over this is why when you look at things like rockets okay the rockets that don't have big payloads that are being fired from gaza what what's the point of the rockets what's the point of these small actions well all of these add up to an incentive for people who are coming here to commit genocide and steal land and commit crimes to understand that that's not going to happen without cost, that they're also, they're, you, you can't do all that and also just have a normal life. There's going to be a constant resistance. There's going to be a constant level of psychological tension. Um, so that's the psychological dimension. Then there are many economic dimensions that we're seeing play out where the blockaders that are trying to blockade Gaza are themselves now being blockaded from the Red Sea. They're being blockaded from the Bab al Mandeb, now the Indian Ocean. Maybe Iran is going to start blockading them uh, and from the Straits of Hormuz. So the the idea of like economic constriction against the Palestinians that Israel is trying to do and sanctions against Iran and economic constriction that the U.S. has done in Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Iran, you know, all over the place. Now this is starting to be applied to Israel um, by the resistance. Um, so the, the people that are blockading are being blockaded. The people that are surrounding are being surrounded. Um, and as uh, the U.S., you know, the Western-led strategy assumes that the U.S. is the only thing that matters. Once you convince the U.S., then everything else that you need follows. Well, the resistance strategy today is betting on the world changing to the point that the U.S. isn't the only thing that matters. The U.S. isn't the only power in the world that decides what happens. Uh, today, there's Russia, there's China, um, and Iran, I think, has recently shown that they also can't be made to submit if the U just, you know, on account of economic pressure and sanctions either, nor can Ansar Allah in Yemen. So the ability to withstand, once you've withstood all of these attacks by the US, you can kind of say, well, um, now we're going to proceed and help the Palestinians of Gaza, and we already know what you're going to do to us and what you can throw at us, and it's not enough to force us to change our minds. So it is an armed struggle strategy that we're witnessing today against Israel that encompasses all of these dimensions that I that I talked about, the military, the economic, um, the psychological. Uh, and in terms of the ideological and the intellectual, I'd like to close by mentioning someone that we've been, um, I'm sure, you know, you've, you've, most of you have probably read this and seen this uh, since the beginning of this war. It's uh, Basel al-Araj, and, uh, and he gave eight rules for war. He, he called it eight rules for war. And this is also like a, someone who, um, was martyred by uh, the Israelis um, pre like years before this uh, this current round of of war. He was from the West Bank, and he wrote a lot. Um, but like he has this very short document from 2014 where he talks about how media analysis or how media kind of people should behave and should the attitude you should take in the face of the Israeli. Uh, invasion in 2014. He said, now there's talk of a ground operation. Several points must be considered. The Palestinian resistance consists of guerrilla formations whose strategies follow the logic of guerrilla warfare. War is never based on the logic of conventional wars and the defense of fixed points and borders. So never mention measure it against conventional wars. So he that's point number one. Don't worry when you see the Israelis invading. That's not the end. That's just the beginning of the guerrilla war. 
Uh, the enemy will too. The enemy will spread photos and videos of their invasions of Gaza. This is part of psychological warfare. You allow your enemy to move as they wish, so they fall into your trap. You decide the timing and location of the battle. The battle is judged by its overall results, and this is merely a show. That's number two. Again, don't be fooled by everything that you're seeing that the Israelis are putting in front of you. Three, never spread the occupation's propaganda and do not contribute to instilling a sense of defeat. Never spread panic, be supportive of the resistance and do not spread any news broadcast by the occupation. Um, the enemy may broadcast images of prisoners. Do not believe them. The enemy will carry out tactical qualitative operations to assassinate some symbols those who've died and who will die will never affect the resistance's system and cohesion the goal is to influence the resistance's support base um so again psychological warfare how to resist psychological warfare all of these points are along those lines our number six our direct human and material losses will be much greater than the enemies which is natural in guerrilla wars that rely on willpower the human element the extent of patience and endurance we are far more capable of bearing the costs so there is no need to compare or be alarmed by the magnitude of the numbers i mean if there's a lesson we need in this horrific case that is definitely one of them and seven uh, today's wars are no longer just wars and clashes between armies, but rather are struggles between society, societies. Let us be like a solid structure, our society against their society. And finally, every Palestinian in the broad sense, meaning anyone who sees Palestine as part of their struggle, regardless of their secondary identities, is on the front lines of the battle for Palestine. So be careful not to fail in your duty. So that's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that, uh, kind of cutting edge guerrilla warfare theory, which was uh, custom written for this conflict um, about 10 years ago now. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Justin. Thank you so much. I mean, a lot of food for thought and also a reminder of uh, the intellectual wealth of ideas that Palestine has gifted us, the struggle has gifted us, you know, it's just, and the martyrs, the number of martyrs, but with that comes this huge, unique wealth of, uh, of intellectual thinking of, you know, really of, uh, of uh, showing a capacity really to to think and analyze reality always in need of a remedial action. And when you are, you know, under such a, a brutal colonization, under which is also supported by US, the US government, US imperialism, you know, really, it, uh, it shows what the mind can do in these moments and the capacity really that people have to push back and to fight. It's, it, was, it was great that you took us back to Basel Large. Um, next speaker, Alex, it's a pleasure to be with you, Alexander Avinia. Uh, let me introduce him. Uh, he's an associate professor of uh, Latin American history at uh, Arizona State uh, University. <clears throat> he hasn't been fired yet. He's the author of Specters of Revolution, Peasant Guerrillas in the Cold War, Mexican Countryside, published in 2014 by Oxford University Press. And he's also written for NACLA, Liberated Text, whose editor is uh, Louis Olday, which we had last week, and uh, for foreign ex exchanges. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matteo. Don't, don't give them any ideas, please. Um, I'd like to have a job. And thanks to, to Justin, and, and I look forward to um, the conversation. Honestly, that's way more interesting for me than just to, for me to, you know, drone on and lecture. Um, and I think before I start, I just want to react to something that Justin said, because we've we've briefly chatted about it in terms of watching for those of us who've like done research and, and read about guerrilla warfare historically or theoretically, like what we're watching right now in real time is, is a qualitative leap in advancement in the development of this form of struggle. We're watching it real time. Right. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, and this is something that I think I've learned um thinking about guerrilla warfare the theory the practice the the history of it is it's a it's always in conversation with the counterinsurgents right it's a, it's a learning process that is happening on on both sides right on the insurgent side but also on the counterinsurgent side but they're also in conversation with one another 
and and it's moving forward, right? So thinking about how right before the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, the American uh, a bunch of American military officers rewatched the Battle of Algiers um, because they figured that there was going to be sustained urban guerrilla warfare in in Iraq, and 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 we did we saw horrific images, especially coming out of Fallujah, right? So I think that's something to keep in mind as as I as a boring old historian, I take you guys back to uh, to uh, Latin America and, and how this idea of guerrilla warfare begins and develops and and um, potentially how it can be a useful uh, past for for those of us today. Uh, and I'm going to start with really like with more. I'm going to have more questions and answers, right? Because a lot of the history that I'm hinting at today, like, requires just much more research uh, because it's transnational, because it's global. Um, hopefully, Mateo and I have talked about this, right? Trying to through Middle East Quarterly. Hopefully, in the near future, we'll have a, a call for papers where we ask people to think about global South to global South transnational links when it comes to revolutionary movements, armed struggle, particularly during during the Cold War era, because there's so much to do there. Um, there's a few really good examples. Um, Jessica Stites Moore has a great book called South South Solidarity. Um, there's some really good literature in Spanish. Pablo Robledo has one called Montoneros y Palestina. Montoneros, I'll, I'll talk about them in a little bit, were a uh, urban guerrilla movement in Argentina during the 70s, um, deeply intertwined with the PLO and the Palestinian liberation struggle. Um, and, and before I, I jump in, just to, uh, a basic point, right, that there's a long history of Palestinian migration to Latin America, uh, dating back to, to the 19th century. Um, the, to this day, Chile has the largest Palestinian community, hundreds of thousands, maybe five to 600,000, maybe more. They have their own soccer team that was founded by Palestinian immigrants, uh, Palestino Club Deportivo. El Salvador has had three presidents of uh, Palestinian descent. Unfortunately, the current one is a bit of a monster, Bukele. Uh, Honduras has had a president of Palestinian ancestry as well, right? So this this is a long history uh, of exchange and interaction between um, this this region that we refer to as Latin America and and, and Palestine. Um, so let me just brief little outline of, of some of the stuff I want to say. Um, first, I'll just think briefly posit some thoughts about the idea of national liberation in Latin American history. Um, how the idea of national liberation in the 19th century differs radically from what we see in the 20th century, particularly when thinking about the emergence of, of guerrilla movements um, after World War II. And then I'll briefly talk about kind of this genealogy, 20th century genealogy of, of armed struggle and, and both rural and urban guerrilla uh, theorizing. And one of the really interesting things that emerges in this is the influence of the Spanish Civil War um, on people like Che Guevara. Um, both because he had the Cubans had a uh, Spanish Civil War exile training them, as I'll mention in a little bit. Um, but it's also interesting to think about that Spain, of course, is where we get the term to begin with. Guerrilla means little war, right? And that was the the war that these Spanish partisans were waging against Napoleon's invasion in the early 19th century. Um, and then I'll finish with some brief historical sketching of Palestine Latin American connections as it pertains to some of the the revolutionary movements. And thinking about you know why this why we need to excavate this history for today um, in the context of this genocide and and what is to be done for those of us who who view uh, Palestine as part of a of a at the center of a broader global struggle. So as a way to introduce my thoughts on the history of, of Palestine and Latin American solidarity, let me just bring two uh, briefly discuss two anecdotes um, because they, and I think they both exemplify the type of solidarities that emerged, particularly in the 60s and 70s and 80s, between revolutionary movements in Palestine and Latin America. There was a lot of cultural work that was done. Um, and there was also actually direct armed exchange and interventions and, and, and collaboration. So the first one refers to the, the cultural movement. And I want to talk about Jorge Giannoni. Jorge Giannoni was an Argentine filmmaker. He was an influential member and founder of the revolutionary third cinema moment, uh, movement sorry, in, the, in the global south this cinematic movement that emerges in the global south that views filmmaking and, and the making of movies and documentaries as part of a broader revolution against colonialism and imperialism in the global south. Um, and, and Giannoni uh, becomes, ends up actually becoming a member of a, of a Trotskyist revolutionary group in Argentina, the ERP, Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo. I'll talk about them in a little bit. But he then travels to Beirut in the late 60s and early 70s uh, with some Italian comrades. And they end up making a, a documentary that I cannot find to this day. I think it's about 22 minutes long. It's short. It's called Palestina Otro Vietnam. 
or Palestine and other Vietnam. It gets uh, produced and, and released in 1971. And the whole process of what I've read about the making of this documentary is quite amazing, right? It involved conversations and interviews in Beirut with members of Fatah, the PFLP, the DFLP, um, Giannoni and his Italian collaborators relied on Palestinian filmmakers for footage, for interviews. Um, they barely had any money. They were living out of a van. Uh, they were barely eating. Um, but they produced this pretty amazing that I really, really want to watch. Um, so if anyone knows where I can get this, please let us know in the, in the chat. Um, it ends up being sc a screen in a film festival in Baghdad in 1973 after Mustafa Abu Ali uh, invited Giannoni to, to submit his film. And, and it actually wins a prize. Um, and this broader cultural movement presented the PLO's cause as part of a broader third world str struggle against colonialism. And in 1973, Giannoni actually travels to Algeria to represent Argentina in this broader global South third cinema mo uh, movement. The other, so that's like the cultural stuff. And I think there's so much good stuff that we need to mine in that history. And I think, um, you know, there's also examples of artists, uh, Karkutli, Burhan Karkutli was a Syrian artist who travels in Central America in the late seventies, does really amazing prints for different Central American revolutionary movements, goes to Mexico, produces one of my favorite images that is now in the Palestinian consulate in Mexico city, which shows Emiliano Zapata and, um, Oh my God, I totally forgot. Al Hussein, the, the, the 1948 uh, revolutionary in Palestinian, right? It's a really cool image that uh, is one of my favorites. So that's like kind of the cultural transnational stuff. The more military guerrilla link, um, I want to talk about Patrick Arguello Ryan. This guy was a Nicaraguense who was born in the U.S. to a well-to-do Nicaraguan family who eventually moves back to Nicaragua. But they're forced to leave in 1956 back to the U.S. after the assassination of the dictator Anastasio Somoza. Um, and that unleashes widespread repression and, and against progressive elements, uh, polit progressive political movements. Um, so Arguello goes back to the U.S. In, 19, in the 1960s. He gets a Fulbright in 1967, um, and he goes to Chile. 1967 is a really key year because that's the October 1967 is the death of Che Guevara in Bolivia. It's also a, a catastrophic military defeat for this incipient guerrilla movement in Nicaragua that will become more famous later on called the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, the, the Sandinista Front for National Liberation. This really, and, and in this, in, uh, uh, Arguello is in Chile at a very particular political moment, the rise of Salvador Allende, right? The revolution of red wine and empanadas, a, a avowed Marxist wins power through democratic elections. Um, but the death of Che and the death of these FSLN guerrillas really impact Arguello. He joins the FSLN and they send him to Europe and they send it where they make contact with the DFLP and eventually the PFLP who provide training to Arguello and, uh, and dozens of different uh, FSLN militants. Uh, part of the requirement for the PF PFLP in providing arms and weapons is that, that the FSLN guerrillas had to participate in some of the military actions. And Arguello uh, participates in a, in, a, in a famous one in September of 1970 when he, along with Leila Khaled, uh, hijacked El Al Flight 219 um, and he ends up getting killed um, on the ground in London um, as, as they were trying to, as the, after the, the, the airplane was forced down by, by the pilots. Uh, a couple years later, the Japanese Red Army will name one of their squads after Patrick Arguello and Gassan Kanafani has a quote about Arguello in which he said, which he wrote, the martyr Patrick Arguello is a symbol for a just cause and the struggle to achieve it, a struggle without limits. He is a symbol for the oppressed and the deprived masses. So in terms of national liberation in Latin American history, I always think about uh, France, France Fanon's uh, warning in the wretched of the earth to, to revolutionaries in the 60s, where he basically says, hey, don't go the route of Latin America. Look what happened to them since their national liberation. And he says that because in the independence in the form that it comes to most Latin American nations in the 19th century is in the form of a, a Creole or a European born in the Americas political project that to gain independence from Spain obviously depended on the masses, on, on, on mixed race masses, on the black uh, people, on indigenous people, on the campesinos to gain independence, but the political form that these newly independent nation states will assume throughout the 19th century is a highly inequitable one that's ruled over essentially by, by white, the descendants of white Europeans who were born in the Americas. And these were oligarchic regimes that sustained uh, decades and decades of messy processes of state formation. Um, but one thing that does emerge is these were not regimes that emerge in favor of the masses, despite the masses having uh, 
sacrificed so much and, and fought so much uh, to gain independence from Spain in the 1810s and 1820s. Um, and there's few exceptions, right? The Haitian Revolution, which I still tell my students is the most radical, the most important revolutionary movement of that moment to study, um, because essentially Haiti, because of the fact that it emerges as an anti-racist, uh, essentially anti-capitalist black, self-declared black republic in 1804, 1805, um, it's, it becomes the first Cuba, right? It becomes blockaded, it becomes uh, expelled from the global order and it becomes attacked. And even, even then, it supplies really important material aid to South American independence leaders like Simón Bolívar, who uh, would not have won independence, would not have been able to succeed had it not been for the support uh, of, of the Haitians. Uh, Mexico is another exception, um, even though that project, the, the revolutionary popular aspect failed and, and it, the way that Mexico gains independence ends up becoming part of this like Creole project. Paraguay is a really uh, outlier as well. Obviously, islands like Cuba and Puerto Rico, uh, well, Puerto Rico is still a colony and it's still fighting for independence. Um, but actually, stepping back a little bit, one, I think the Puerto Rican national liberation movements throughout the last two centuries, I think we still have a lot of work to do and kind of chronicling and researching them. We have a lot of learning as well. Um, a lot of the, the, so national liberation is an idea that gets captured by these Creole elite political projects. And the 19th century, when we see the emergence of what we now see as, as guerrilla warfare, um, guerrilla warfare emerges as part of these interesting conflicts between different elite factions within these different newly independent countries, or they emerge um, in response to external aggression. So Mexico is a famous case, right? They you have guerrilla movements throughout the 19th century in reaction to Spanish reinvasion and in, in, in reaction to a French invasion in reaction to the United States invasion. And then the French come back in the 1860s. Um, and that really cements a, a, a tradition of rural guerrilla warfare that's gonna continue to this very day because we still have guerrilla movements in Mexico in the mountains doing their thing, um, even if they're not uh, quite visible or uh, militarily quite significant from the perspective of the, of the Mexican state. Um, but the idea, the, this idea of partisan or guerrilla struggle in the 19th century emerges uh, as part of these civil wars, but also in reaction to external uh, invasion, uh, particularly as we get to the late 19th century and Latin America is in, forcibly included into a global market as a uh, semi-colonial, in a semi-colonial capacity where providing cheap labor and cheap natural resources and markets for manufactured and industrial goods being produced by the global north. It's in the 20th century where we get the, the connection of armed struggle and guerrilla warfare or partisan warfare with revolution, right? And, um, and I don't say this just because I'm a Mexican or I'm a nationalist, but the first global peasant revolution of the 20th century was in Mexico. And that this is another history that it begs to be incorporated globally to show the global influence and impact that it had. Uh, there's a great book that recently came, back, came out that, that talks about this and the name is totally slipping. Uh, Christina Heatherton is the author. Um, and, and she does a great job of showing how this peasant mass peasant based revolution that had its own guerrilla warfare in the form of the movements led by uh, Emiliano Zapata and, and Pancho Villa, uh, the sort of impact it had throughout South America, the Caribbean. Um, and we even have a letter of Emiliano Zapata to Lenin, where he's talking about how the Russian Revolution, and the Mexican Revolution share the same cause, which is, you know, basically the the struggle of the exploited classes against their oppressors. Um, so quickly to move to move on to that, um, the Mexican Revolution and its in its completion in 1917 with its uh, with a with a really the first social democratic constitution in the world at, up before the Russian Revolution is the most radical constitution in the world. Um, it enshrines this idea of economic nationalism, radical economic nationalism, uh, the idea that sovereignty is not just uh, it, it relegated in the political sphere, but it also involves the economic sphere as well. Um, so all, you know, the idea that all Mexican natural resources belong to the people, not to, to transnational corporations, as it had before. And the Mexican Revolution also introduces the idea of national liberation against oligarchies linked to foreign capital and, and foreign powers like the United States. To the 1920s in Central America, we get the movement in Nicaragua by, led by Augusto Cesar Sandino, um, who uh, leads, a, a, in the words of Gabriela Mistral, a Chilean journalist and poet, he leads a crazy little army against the US Marines from the late 1920s to the early 1930s. And if the Mexican Revolution introduced this idea of economic nationalism, Sandino's movement in Nicaragua introduces the idea of a, of a radical insurgent political nationalism um, that's based you know, in reaction to constant US interventions in Nicaragua dating back to the mid 19th century. 
Um, their, their flag shows a uh, Nicaraguan campesino guerrillero about to behead with a machete a U.S. Marine. Like it's a very it's a very um, kind of crazy flag. That's their battle flag. Um, and so by the time we get in Latin America to the late 20s, early 30s, we have these two models of economic nationalism, political nationalism that are going to fuel um, resistance in the region, at least up until World War II, a, against particularly the U.S. empire in the region, uh, an empire that had intervened militarily in Latin America about 30 to 40 times from 1898 to the 1930s, almost always in the form of the U.S. Marines. Um, but the, the early 30s is also a particular moment, inter, interesting moment globally, because it's the third period of the common turn, right? And this, this moment of the 1928-1933, where um, the Soviet Union, through the Communist International, has a particular reading of the global situation as capitalism, uh, as an imminent uh, catastrophic uh, failure and destruction, and therefore it's a moment to support direct action and armed struggle um, in, in the semi-colonial and colonial peripheries of the global capitalist system. Um, and it, this gets us really interesting ideas like in the US with uh, the Black Belt thesis where black workers would take over the part, large parts of the southern United States to create their own independent nation. Um, in El Salvador in 1932, it leads to this indigenous communist alliance to, that, that emerges to try to take over the country um, uh, after uh, fraudulent elections and um, you know, they end up being massacred. Uh, something like 20 to 40,000 people are killed and it's, called, it's still referred to as La Masacre, the massacre in, in El Salvador to this day. Um, but one of the interesting things that emerges also from this third period, this idea of like direct action, this idea of armed struggle and direct action and not waiting for objective conditions of revolution to be set. And we're gonna see almost the reactivation of, the, of these ideas from the early thirties in the, in the fifties and sixties when, when we get to uh, Che Guevara's um, theorizing. But there's one guy who I think is really interesting who starts theorizing about guerrilla warfare in the late, in the early 1930s. Uh, it's a Peruvian military officer by the name of Julio Guerrero. And he's actually the first Latin American officer who's invited by the Red Army Chief of Staff in 1928. So he goes to the Soviet Union and he writes about how all his, uh, uh, all the, the, the stereotypes that he had about the Soviet Union were completely smashed. Um, he was blown away by the military discipline, by their modern weaponry, by their tactics. And what really caught his attention was by this alliance in the army between what he called the proletarian and the peasant. Um, and he starts, kind of starts trying to think of how he can fit that into his own particular strategic and, and, and tactical military reading in, in Latin America. And this is also in line with another Peruvian who had been theorizing throughout the 1920s about how uh, we didn't need to wait for those objective conditions for revolution. And that's Mariategui, Jose Mariategui, who really tried to Latin Americanize Marxism to make it fit within a Latin American uh, context. And he starts to theorize about Inca or indigenous socialism. Um, so it's a really interesting, I, I think, theoretical and political moment in Latin America. Going back to Su Guerrero, Guerrero writes an interesting piece in 1931-1932 called Guerra de Guerrillas, una modalidad de la lucha armada del futuro. So guerrilla warfare, a modality of the future, question mark. And it's a really interesting piece because he's anticipating what ends up happening in the Cold War. He has a, he has a very interesting reading of of governments and regimes in Latin America. He's thinking about this alliance between the military uh, the Catholic Church and the landed elites and how that prevents political reform and, and, and in moments of attempts to gain political reform, they react with terror and that terror radicalizes these uh, previous reformists. This is what's actually going to happen in the late 40s and early 50s with an entire new generation of Latin American revolutionaries. Um, so he's really, I think, one of the first theorists, I think, in Latin America of, of guerrilla warfare. Um, and focusing it on the countryside. And he's doing, also doing his own reading of Peruvian history to kind of back up his point that rural guerrilla warfare is going to be a future modality of struggle in the region. Um, to quickly jump forward uh, to, to the Cold War, you have this, you know, what ends up defeating the Third International is, is obviously the popular front um, in the US is this crazy idea of routerism where we don't have class conflict, we have class collaboration. We have to ally ourselves with um, uh, progressive forces to defeat fascism um, and, 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 and that becomes the main uh, goal of these communist parties in Latin America. And, if, and from the 40s on, communist parties in Latin America will be seen um, by younger generations as being collaborationist to a certain extent. Um, 
they're still waiting around for the nationalist progressive bourgeoisie to emerge to launch a national democratic revolution, which will then set the stage for a future socialist revolution. Um, and, and that idea is, uh, is, is cemented in most of these communist parties in Latin America throughout the 1940s and 1950s. So when we get to the Cold War in Latin America and we have these, this, these democratic spring times of reform that are briefly unleashed in the 1940s, ruthlessly crushed by state terrorism and conservative dictatorships and authoritarianism by the late 40s and early 50s, um, you have a generation of young people who want to engage in revolutionary action and change, but their communist parties tend to be still caught within the stages conception of history that then leads to certain political outcomes that involves either going underground because they're being outlawed or continuing to collaborate with an electoral arena or limiting their efforts to trade union um, activity. Um, and this ends up in Latin America creating a split between this old left um, and the emergence of a new left that's uh, about direct action, that's about guerrilla warfare, that's about armed struggle. Uh, the quote that really encapsulates this idea is, is Fidel Castro's famous quote about the duty of every revolutionary is to make revolution. Um, and once, once uh, Latin American reformers uh, view what the U.S. empire is willing to do to smash reform in the region after the overthrow of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954, this unleashes processes of political radicalization that lead to the adoption of direct action and armed struggle as a feasible political option for an entire generation of young Latin Americans. And we should remember that uh, a, a certain young Argentine doctor uh, working in Guatemala had to flee for his life into the Argentine embassy in Guatemala uh, before he was then allowed to go and travel to Mexico and that young Argentine doctor was obviously uh, Che Guevara. Um, so thinking about the next little blink, I guess, in the in this genealogy of guerrilla warfare is you get the uh, Cubans and, and Che Guevara meeting up in Mexico City in the mid 1950s. I'm not going to, that's going to, if I go into the history, it's going to take forever, but they meet up in Mexico City and they're plotting a return to Cuba to overthrow the dictator Batista. Um, and there in Mexico City, they meet an old veteran of the Spanish Civil War, Alberto Bayo. And Alberto Bayo ends up publishing, he had already published on guerrilla warfare all the way back in the 1930s. He has another one of these pieces where it's like the, 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 struggle, the form of struggle in the future is going to be guerrilla warfare. Um, he had actually fought in the Rif War um, in the 1920s in Morocco. And then um, during the Spanish Civil War, he was on the Republican side and his whole plot, his whole like, tactic was to use guerrilla warfare as a way to bring the Rift War to Madrid against the Nationalists, against the Francoists. Um, it didn't work. But he did end up training um, this, this Cuban contingent that was uh, going back to Cuba to, to retake their country and that one Argentine doctor that decided to, to accompany them. Um, and the, 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 the outcome of this, the Cuban Revolution from 1956 to 1959 uh, leads to the publication of Che Guevara's very you know, seminal text that Mateo already mentioned in the chat, um, uh, Guerrilla Warfare. And that's his idea of, of, uh, of how to wage guerrilla warfare in Latin America based on his experiences on, on Latin America. Now, one of the things I think that emer one of the things to keep in mind is that the, the distance between uh, revolutionary theory and revolutionary practice, uh, because one of the, I think, inadvertent consequences of, of Che's guerrilla warfare theorizing is that it, it kind of misrepresents or, or leaves out really important facets of the Cuban revolutionary struggle. The one being that the guys who were up in the Sierra Maestra mountain would have been wiped out had there not been an urban underground supplying them with information, with weaponry, with new cadres. So even though the Cuban revolution, the image that emerges from it with the bearded barbudos uh, up in the Sierra Maestra mountain, eventually becoming powerful enough to descend onto the central plains and take over Havana is, is, is let's say less than half the story, because what allowed them to survive and expand was the political work and the sacrifices that a lot of these urban underground cadres were doing in places like Havana. Um, and that more or less gets left out of Che Guevara's uh, guerrilla warfare text. And, and the three main points that he, that, he, that, that, that he develops in this text around this idea of a focal theory or of a cell theory of revolution um, is that one, the popular forces can win against the army. Uh, two, it is necessary to wait. It is not necessary to wait until all conditions for making revolutions exist. The insurrection can create the conditions necessary for a revolution, and this is against again against these uh, Latin American communist parties' approach to, to 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 change. And third, in underdeveloped America, the countryside is a ba basic area of armed fighting, and and 
but again, one of the things that also gets left out, I think people ignore is that Che also has a couple of warnings in there. He says, no popular struggle, no victory, no, no popular support, no victory, and that all peaceful and legal recourses have to be exhausted before you can convince people that uh, risking their lives for an indeterminate end is something worthwhile, a worthwhile endeavor to take. Um, Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare manual, he said that he didn't, uh, was not, hadn't read Mao, um, he says that he was really influenced by Spanish Civil War writers like Alberto Bayo. Um, he was, uh, who ends up, ends up publishing his own piece in 1959 called 150 Questions for Guerrillas. Um, but it fails, right? It, through, a, a lot of movements emerged throughout Latin America in the early to mid 1960s who, who try to create uh, rural guerrilla forces focus uh, in the Guevarista style. And they fail, and the, and the big um, the big example of this is what happens to Che Guevara himself in Bolivia in October 1967, which his idea of creating a revolution in Bolivia and expanding it continentally fails. Um, he's captured and he's killed. Um, this then leads to a shift to urban guerrilla warfare where warfare theorizing, and this is where we get I think one the, the more famous uh, manual is is Carlos Marighella, a Brazilian urban revolutionary who publishes a mini manual of the urban guerrilla in 1969. Um, and a much lesser known, I think, but much more interesting a text is, is published in 1966 by Abraham Guillén, who was a Spanish Civil War veteran who escaped to South America. And his is called Strategy of the Urban Guerrilla. Uh, the reason why I, I think Abraham Guillén is a more interesting one is because he starts to uh, theorize, it's about urban guerrilla warfare, but it's, it's a more hybrid form where he stresses the necessity of both, he stresses the necessity or the actual, the, the realization that Latin America is becoming more urbanized in the 1960s, 1970s. Therefore, there's more people in the cities. Uh, that's gonna create even more contradictions within this capitalist system. So we need to theorize how to, uh, how to do armed struggle in the cities, but he does it in a hybrid form where he says that it, it, the rural and the urban are working together. And that ends up being really influential idea through some of the more important urban guerrilla movements that emerged in Latin America in the late 60s and 70s. In Uruguay, you have the Tupamaros, the, the movement of national liberation Tupamaros. Um, in Argentina, you get something like 17 different armed guerrilla groups that are mostly based in the cities, but they still are able to organize uh, sugarcane workers in Argentina, or you're able to work organize tomato pickers in Northern uh, Mexico. So there's this really Less doc, this doctrinaire, less sectarian idea of how to wage guerrilla warfare uh, using both the rural and the urban sectors as uh, as the guiding uh, the, the 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 broader uh, space for for revolution. And another thing that Guillen does is that he theorizes um, he starts to introduce ideas about prolonged or protected popular war. Right. So, so with Justin uh, mentioned Mao and 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 Jiap. Uh, this idea also starts to be really influential in, in, in guerrilla movements in Latin America in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the Vietnamese example ends up being really important. You even have the instance of like one Argentine guerrilla who goes and fights in the Vietnam War and he gets support. He always claimed he got a medal from Ho Chi Minh. Uh, we don't know if that's actually true. That was his his recalling of the of the incident. Um, so you have this interesting idea of primarily conducting armed struggle in the cities based on long protracted political work in organizing neighborhoods and getting popular support um, and, and interfacing with, with the rural sector as well. Um, and, and so in that sense, I think Abraham Guillén is a really interesting figure who hasn't been covered as much. Um, and for me, he's interesting again, because he's thinking about the rural and the urban at the same time. It's, he's not saying it's either the rural sector where the revolution has to start or it has to be the urban one where in the form that Carlos Marighella theorized about his experiences in Brazil, where the revolution would have to start in the cities and then would spread um, to the countryside. Um, I didn't even mention Rigé Debray for a bunch of reasons, but because uh, he kind of sucks, but uh, he is also another one of these uh, intell French intellectual who actually did, was with Che when he was captured in 1967. Uh, but some of his ideas on, on, on revolution, uh, based on a really dogmatic reading of the Cuban revolution, and then he ends up having quite an interesting political conversion uh, later on in his life. Um, but he makes the point um, in his text that there was just an impossibility of urban guerrilla warfare in Latin America, and that decade later, um, almost all the rural all the guerrilla warfare in Latin America is is uh, is urban. Um, 
Now, just to quickly to, to mention, just uh, to move beyond the genealogy to some historical examples, um, and then I'll, I'll stop talking because I've been talking for too long. But um, there's two uh, sectors that, that demonstrate deep links between Palestine and Latin America, particularly when it comes to exchanges between revolutionary forces. One is Argentina. From the late 60s and early 70s, you have extensive uh, exchanges and links between groups like the Montoneros, uh, groups like the ERP, um, who are uh, you know, communicating with, with Yasser Arafat, with the PLO, with Fatah, um, and with the PFLP. Um, and they have a, a really deep relationship throughout the 60s and the 70s up until the military dictatorship takes over in, in 1976 and unleashes one of the worst dictatorships in Latin American history. Um, and the other is, is Central America. Um, and Central America, particularly with Nicaragua, with the FSLN, they survived that, that, that catastrophic military defeat in 1967. They reorganize their forces. They adopt um, a more prolonged popular warfare tactic, gathering of forces in silence. And, and that allows them to recapture its strength, to expand. Um, and by 1978, 79, they're launching a revolution against the third Somoza who had been in power, Tachito Somoza. And the FSLN throughout the 70s has really close links and conversations and even material support from the PLO and from the PFLP. But none of this would have been possible if it hadn't been for one island in the Caribbean that still is suffering for what they did in 1959, which is Cuba. Cuba and, and Castro and Fidel Castro establishing relationships as early as the mid 1960s uh, and then strengthening those ties, especially up to the 67 war. Cuba became like a, 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 a place where you could have meetings and exchanges uh, between uh, different Palestinian groups and different Latin American revolutionary groups um, to the point where by 1973 Cuba severed ties with Israel. They have not reestablished ties with Israel and according to one account they handed over the Israeli embassy to the PLO so they could use it as their own embassy, which I think is, is a nice, was a nice gesture. But it's really Cuba that allows for these really interesting exchanges, Global South exchanges between Palestine and Latin American revolutionary groups to happen. Um, I was going to make one more point and what was, what was that point that I was going to make about Cuba? But I totally, totally, oh, uh, the one last thing I'll say, and this is, uh, as a plea for those of you to do more research on this. Part of the Cuban effort to establish ties with the PLO and with Palestinian groups goes all the way back to Che Guevara's visit to Gaza in 1959 um, upon the invitation of Nasser, right? So che, che meets with different Fedayeen leaders. He's giving feedback on uh, rural guerrilla warfare. Um, they're having really interesting conversations. They're trying to set up some sort of program where they could exchange training and military weapons. Uh, che really wanted to do it through Nasser. Um, and after that visit, Cuba began to give scholarships to Palestinian students and they even gave citizenship to certain Palestinians as well. So that, that was the, the beginning of a relationship that continues to this day in terms of Cuban solidarity uh, for Palestine. And by the, I'll, end, I'll end with this. And, and this is um, what you start to see then in the 70s and 80s in Latin America, especially in Central America, is that you see the PLO and you see Palestine on the side of progressive revolutionary forces in Central America who are trying to overthrow some of the worst death squad regimes in the history of Latin America. And on the other side, you see Israel being on the side of those death squad regimes, providing training, providing weaponry, providing military advisors, providing napalm, when, because these death squad regimes were so bad that even the United States couldn't fund them because of Cong congressional uh, prohibitions. Although obviously they found ways around that with Iran Contra, but that's another story for another day. So it, it becomes really interesting and, and very clear that within Latin America, by the 80s, Palestine, the PLO and other Palestinian groups are on the side of revolutionary forces and actually providing material help. And um, you see Israel as an innovator of counterinsurgency and state terrorism on the side of these horrific death squad regimes that in a place like Guatemala was actually committing genocide in the, in the early 1980s. Um, but and I'll leave with the, the fame, and I think this, these exchanges, at least on the Palestinian side, remind me of, of Kanafani's famous quote, where he said, the Palestinian cause is not a cause for Palestinians only, but a cause for every revolutionary wherever he is, as a cause of the exploited and the oppressed masses in our era. And I think that would be a great kind of guiding quote for those of us who, who are interested in continue to excavate this history of, of, of links, uh, both material and, and theoretical and political links between Palestine and Latin America. All right, I'll stop there. I talked way too much.
Thanks, Alex. Thanks so much for uh, for giving us this genealogy and also to make uh, to for making us think through some of the you know some of the ideas that emerged uh, throughout that time, which also you know it may it may you know like uh, it forced me also to think through like. Uh, I'm just gonna go with a comment, guys. I'm sorry, and then you know we take some of the Q and A that we have. Uh, one of the things that made me think, you know, because I was thinking through the to the present struggle of in Palestine right now, and uh, I was thinking like uh, this uh, this really uh, push for direct action that you can see like emerging in Latin America during the time you were describing. We're not waiting for the objective conditions, although obviously they were they were looking at history and saying, okay, we need to do this. But at the same time, I'm lo I'm thinking of, uh, I'm looking at the present, you know, and I'm thinking, uh, and that's what I would like to hear more from you, like uh, the the trajectory also that Latin America has had, and uh, and I, because I happen I uh, to read some of the work of I think his name is Alberto Garcia Liniera, uh, the one of the vice president of of Bolivia under Morales. And, it's, and you know, and there is this whole idea of uh, is Latin America now in a moment of reform or revolution, and uh, and how does that kind of trajectory then goes and influence Latin American countries looking at Palestine now? And I also wonder on another point, uh, how as uh, the defeat, and that's also for Justin actually this question, how as the defeat of Pan Arabism and the secular struggle in the region affected. And the rise of the axis of resistance, which centers Islam also in the way he wants to push for a, for the national liberation of Palestine. How has this affected then these solidarities across the globe? Because all of a sudden you're going through the war on terror, Islam, the whole Islamophobia. And now there is this need to, you know, to start interacting differently, not on the basis of, you know, communist ideals anymore, but, uh, you know, different kind of ideological uh, underpinnings of these struggles. And so is that something that Latin America is struggling right now to, are we seeing this or was that already happening back in the days? This kind of, uh, you we can see already a, a different type of solidarity that goes beyond Marxism or uh, I don't know, this is something. And, uh, and, and Justin, one thing is that I really would like to hear more from you is uh, the non-violence point, you know, as a strategic choice, uh, as a class position, we get there. I mean, like, uh, it's it's not a moral question. It is a strategy for a class position, okay? So when we look at a context like the West, and by the West, I mean Europe and the US, is it, uh, do, do, is the level of uh, violence so far too low for what it's happening in, not for what it's happening in Palestine, for the location and the historical position that the West has in, you know, in vis-a-vis -vis Palestine are protests in a way still too non-violent when it comes to Palestine. And I'm not saying, you know, we should go and, you know, just burn everything down or anything like this, but uh, how do you uh, look, how do you analyze the historical position of the West and the protest also happening, the kind of movements that are emerging inside the West right now, are they enough? Are they doing enough? Or... Uh, or uh, we might actually see an escalation on that front, or maybe not. I mean, I, I know this is a speculative terrain, but you know, I'm just trying to to think through what you, you guys were saying, and then questions are popping, and we take those. And thank you both. Okay, uh, I'll try to answer you my t the last question first because I wasn't taking notes, so I may have missed. Uh, I think there was one on like uh, Arab history and the failure of Pan Arabism. So, but let me just let me just say about this question of of protest in the West, it's, um, I don't look at it, I, I don't see these things as prescriptive anymore. I, I kind of think of it as scientific in a way where what's happening is what's happening. We have to figure out what's happening, not what should happen because, you know, if I was gonna go down the route of what should happen, none of this should have happened, right? So as far as protest goes, it's more a question of why why do they take the form that they do? What is what is um what is what are the limitations that are that are built into the program of protest? And I I think uh I think part of the reason they're 
I think, I, you know, I think part of the reason I've is, as I've mentioned, is that there's a paradigm of, you know, we are trying to influence politicians. And, and I think, I think there's a, I think there's a contradiction. I think there are certain things about this, this way of doing things that are repelling, repel the mind, like, the idea that Israel can commit genocide for seven months and then be rewarded for stopping as opposed to there being some punishment for a campaign of mass murder. Like nobody's going to go to jail for mass murder. No, but you know, the idea that, that all of these um, like somebody like Piers Morgan, I, I, I don't mean to like focus on Piers Morgan, but like somebody like Piers Morgan can incite genocide for seven months and then if he has somebody on that's good and and isn't especially aggressive, everybody's applauding. Like, yay, we we got this genocidal inciter to allow somebody on who's who's anti-genocide. So it's just there's an idea of justice that is lost. And that I also I don't know. I don't know if that's a concept. Maybe, you know, I think in negotiations sometimes and peace processes. You have to make compromises. You have to make peace with your enemies, and you have to and and I you know that's what's happening in Qatar or where in Egypt, where Hamas and Israel are presumably constantly having these dialogues. Well, you know Hamas is not in a position to punish the Israeli officials for uh, ordering and and being authors of genocide. Hamas is in the position of having to talk to them, and that's how guerrilla war goes. Mao had. Mao talked about this constantly, right? I mean, this is what happened in Vietnam too. There were periods of negotiation and there were periods of fighting and genocide in Vietnam, outright genocide, and then periods of negotiation again. So, you know, what what is happening with protests in North America is it's uh, it's it's the availability of the safety valves of electoralism the idea that by changing the party you're gonna make some change the idea that everything has to go up to november the idea that we have to you know move these people's hearts non-violently all of these things play into why it takes the form that it does um I, I, you know, and, and for all of that, I think, you know, more of that is better, better than less of that. So, you know, I, I just sort of feel like whatever people are doing, they should try to do more of. And it's, it's great to see things like what's happening at Columbia University um, and Yale now, and maybe Harvard is getting in on it. And, and, you know, all of these things that traditionally happen in the U.S. protests on campuses and and on the streets and, and in subway terminals and people getting arrested for civil disobedience. All of that is good stuff. Those are all good things. Um, I'll let uh, Alex answer a question before I go to the Arab, uh, pan-Arabism question. Uh, yeah, I wasn't writing down your questions, Mathil, but the one I did catch about solidarity beyond Marxism, um, yeah, I don't, it's a really good question. I think that it's gonna require more work on it because uh, it is interesting that a lot of these exchanges happen be with the, like the PFLP, VFLP. I mean, there's obviously like uh, ideological connections and agreement, um, particularly involving the, the idea of armed struggle. But there is something happening at the popular level, particularly after the 1967 war, where by today, like very few, if very few, if any Latin American countries, maybe like that Salvador today vote for Israel, like at the United Nations, right? And that's like a sustained move from 67 to today, right? So Petro says, talks about how Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia talks about how only a few countries in Europe and North America and sinking islands in the Pacific vote for Israel uh, to support this barbarism today. That's the language he uses. That took a lot of work for 67, political and cultural work to in the, for, for, for Latin American governments from 67 to today to get to that position. Because before that, uh, Latin America was a reliable block for Israeli support from 48 up until 1967. Um, and so what has happened since then? Well, it's obviously that, that Israel has delegitimized de itself in a variety of different ways. It's, uh, it's, it's shown its fangs, uh, both what it's doing for its own political interests and its own settler colonialism, but also in supporting some of the worst death squad regimes in Latin America. Um, but it would be, it, it is an interesting question to think about how at, by the end of the Cold War, 
um, you know, how these solidarities are linked uh, beyond beyond Marxism. I think one potential fruitful avenue of research or thinking could be kind of similarities with like liberation theology um, and, and, and Islam. Um, I think that would be a really fruitful uh, uh, potential convergence to think about, um, particularly when it comes like with the question of violence, right? and this is to Justin's point about, about nonviolence. You have really, you have priests who like stop being priests and join guerrilla movements in Latin America in the 60s and 70s. And the way they kind of square that with themselves is that um, it's self like armed struggle as self-defense to build a kingdom of heaven here on earth, right? So they'll say, we're not the ones being violent. We didn't start the violence. We are living in a context where violence is constitutive of that context and we are fighting against it. So we are actually defending ourselves and our people in our effort to make a better world for everybody. And you see that with Camilo Torres, who was a Colombian priest who joined the, 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 the Ejército de Liberación Nacional in Colombia in the late 60s. You see it throughout the 70s and 80s in, in Nicaragua in its Sandinista revolution, where I think its first cabinet included, once they won the revolution, its first cabinet had like three or four different priests, including Ernesto Cardenal, who's like one of my, my heroes. I mean, if you ever want to check out really interesting liberation theologian and revolutionary. I think he has, he has some really good, wonderful writings. Uh, but I, again, that, that's, that's a, a great avenue for more research that, that would beg more research, I think. Should I answer this question of Pan-Arabism? Yeah, yeah, um, that's... So Pan-Arabism, the, the idea, the anchor of that project was always Egypt and necessarily had to be Egypt. Egypt is the big country in the Arab world. It's the it's the biggest country. It's it's as big as almost most of the other ones combined, right? There's there's Iraq and Syria, um, and then there's you know smaller ones. Um, there's Saudi Arabia. There's the Gulf monarchies. There's Jordan. There's um, Iraq. Did I mention Iraq already? Um, so, but Egypt had to be the the big um, was going to be the big power, and and Egypt, um, you know, I don't know how to put it. Like Egypt wasn't up for that task. Egypt was not uh, up for it in terms of organization, in terms of like a political party and 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 preparation uh, for it. And you see the way that the Egyptian struggle has unfolded even since 2011, you, you kind of see that um, absence, the way that like there's this interplay between the brotherhood and the civil society and, and, uh, and the army, the kind of politicized army and the army constantly just like even, even because even though the army is not very well organized or, or very capable, they're just the ones who constantly end up in charge because they're better organized than the alternatives, it seems, and you know, brutal and and subordinate them subordinate themselves to the U.S. and Israel to the extent that they can. So it's it's just a, but but here's the thing, I guess. Here's what I would say, like just the same way that Shaz, um, that General Shazley or Commander Shazley, uh, said that Lebanon wasn't going to amount to anything, like by by Israel and the US eliminating one, taking one after another of these uh, enemies off of the table, you know, out, off of, out of the game, right? So they, they won Egypt over once uh, Anwar Sadat took, took power and, and Sadat just brought them, the entire country of Egypt into their camp. They, um, you know, Jordan was always in there, um, but more, they seem to be more in there than, than ever after April 14th. Um, but but like the you know the Saudi the Gulf uh, monarchies, but then the destruction of Iraq right in two thousand three and the destruction of Syria after twenty from twenty eleven to twenty fifteen, and and yet right and yet after all that, there's there's a whole new set of of problems that arise for Israel like Iran Ansar Allah. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon so it, it there there's never um history doesn't stop you don't just they don't the imperialists don't get to 
kind of take out their enemies and then live happily ever after. And and in a way, like I, I think it was Elijah, Mag it was somebody like Elijah Magnier or, or somebody else that I, I watched, I was watching and they, no, it was Jacques Baud, you know, Jacques Baud, he's like a, he's like a Swiss colonel. He wrote a, he wrote book, he wrote, simultaneously wrote books on Al-Aqsa flood and Russia, Ukraine. And they both came out with him like a couple days of each other or something. But, but Jacques Baud said, he, he said something interesting. He said, Iran is like an enemy that the the Israelis conjured out of nothing. The Iranians had no they're, they're so far from Israel. Israel was not on their minds. You know, Iraq attacked them. Um, you know, they defended themselves from Iraq and then all and and they were fine with anybody. They didn't have a special problem with Israel. And Israel decided like we're going to we're going to have to they're going to have to get rid of their nuclear program and they're going to have to get rid of this and they're going to have to get rid of that and we're going to assassinate their scientists and we're going to bomb their react like they 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 made is Iran this country that's 10 times their size and you know has good relations with all kinds of people near near them and has an industrial base and the huge numbers of engineers and scientists and and very capable people they decided that that they were going to make they were going to bully iran and and so it it's not just that history doesn't stop it's also that these kind of this kind of supremacist psychology conjures enemies and it has to constantly conjure enemies until it's ultimately defeated and sooner or later they're going to conjure enough enemies to defeat them and that's why it's also like I've I've been saying on the sit reps, at some level you have to analyze Israel in terms of psychology more than in terms of strategy, because from a rational perspective, their strategy doesn't make any sense. They just keep going until more and more people hate them and until they can't win anymore. They keep grasping for things until they can't hold them. Thank you both. I I mean, uh, Alex, I'd, you know, I know I, I'm going to just, you know, if you can say something more about you said about Palestine, I wonder if you can say anything about Israel infiltration of Latin America, if there is anything to be said there, because I think it's interesting as well. But then we got some questions for you, but just keep it there on the side for now, if you want, just keep it on the corner. But you you both been asked about uh, there is a land asking about uh, She's asking about a lot of the strands of the people's war in China. I'm sure you've read the question anyway. And Vietnam came from the liberated areas that enabled survival and demonstrated the possibilities of communist-led society. Are we seeing any Soviet building like constra, you know, like configuration by the Palestinian resistance nowadays that can serve these functions? Uh, I mean, anybody wants to take? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just, I, I, yeah, this is an interesting question because the thing about Palestine is it's it's like all in this sense, it's kind of backwards because China had feudalism and and colonization. And then they had a movement to liberate themselves from that. And and Palestine, you know, if you look at like Ilan Pape and what he writes and what he says about Palestine before before Zionist colonization, it was kind of utopian. It was kind of like, it was a place where, you know, I don't like problems, blah, blah, blah. But like uh, China has problems now, right? Like Vietnam has problems now, but like it was a place where Muslims and Christians and Jews lived together. It was a place of like agricultural development of orange trees and olive trees. And, um, you know, and there what you know there was feudalism but but it, like it was a particular crossroads it was it was a particularly diverse and special society and in a lot of ways um and for that reason it's like resi it, it, like yeah so palestine would be a liberated air like once it's free if if they go back to that that is a liberated zone um, I don't know. Uh, so, so in in a sense, like the the backwards looking vision for Palestine is a, is of a liberated area where where especially this issue of like you know religion and people living in in peace and harmony, literally like 
people of different religions living in peace and harmony in the Holy Land. That's what happened before Zionism. So if Palestinians are, are you know, building that, that is a liberated area. Like, it, it's true that this is, like, the Palestinian resistance, the resistance of, the axis of resistance is, has an Islamic character to it. It has a Muslim character to it, but it also... You know, I don't think that that's um, I don't think that that's the whole story, especially when you talk when you look at the military aspect of it, when you look at the military unity between the uh, nationalists, the Islamic groups and the outright atheist socialists that you see fighting together in Gaza. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, the institutions that they had that were all destroyed, like the universities, the educational institutions, the the way that they educate their children in, in spaces, like everything they do is a liberated zone almost. So it's a, it's not like, um, it's a little different from feudal China where they had to defeat, you know, feudal landlords and engage in this land reform because it's been a situation of dual power and building a society under occupation and, and genocidal resistance this whole time. I think it would also mark the completion of a process that began after World War II. Right? And this is like Israel as an anachronistic creation. As, as the global South decolonizes, then you have the reestablishment of a settler colony that goes against that process. So I, it, it, so it would get us closer to completing that. Pro I mean, there's, there's still colonies, right? There's still, I, I think a lot about Puerto Rico, but I, it would be, it would mark a, a certain like end of a chapter that like has been going on for decades. Um, I think also like the, 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 the successful guerrilla movements in Latin America all had that in common about having a liberated, a space, a liberated space that allowed for political work, that allowed for the setting up of subversive radio stations that could then get real information out to the populace, whether it was in the Sierra Maestra mountains in, in Cuba or in, in Nicaragua or Radio Rebelde in, um, I think, what's it all that? I can't remember the name of the radio in the FMLN in El Salvador. Um, they did have those liberated spaces. I mean, and that's like a, 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 that to a certain extent, it determined whether they succeeded or not in the revolutionary struggle. I think what we see now, and we've talked about it, Justin and, and Mateo on, on Tanky Therapy, uh, the mountains in in Palestine are the tunnels, right? In Gaza, that's their, those are their mountains. Um, where are you know what what are the mountains in the West Bank? I mean, that might look like more like the urban guerrilla warfare that that we've talked about. Um, and I think one more point I'd like to make that's kind of disconnected is thinking about what armed struggle means at the individual level for someone who's engaged in that practice. Um, you know, listening to some of the interventions by Abdel Jawad Omar, especially like on millennials killing capitalism, the way he talks about what it means to engage in armed struggle for, for young people in the West Bank and in this immensely dangerous activity, right? Like potentially lethal, um, or it could lead to tor horrific torture. There's a, they feel like a certain freedom in that activity. And that I think is a common trait, like amongst all revolutionary guerrilla movements. Um, there's, um, there's a documentary about the Black Panther Party that came out some years ago on PBS, but they interviewed a Black Panther Party member who was involved in the shootout with the Los Angeles Police Department and their SWAT team in 1969. It's, you have these Black Party members in a house shooting it out for hours with the police and the SWAT team. And they interview a veteran uh, who, who survived that, that conflict. And he said, you know, in that moment, I felt finally free. I felt like a free Black man for the first time in my life. And I've interviewed a bunch of like former guerrilla fighters in Mexico and that they all talked about that. Like they're shooting it out against all odds with like police or with military and they're like, I'm free. Or I talked to one guerrillera who talked about how she was able to be free up in the mountains because she was able to escape the confines of a patriarchal household. She didn't have to be subjected to her father's whims, her brother's whims. She could be free up in the mountains. So. I, that I think is also like thinking about what this means at the individual level, um, because I think this is important and this is touches on something to bring it back to what Justin said. That activity radicalizes people. It opens up possibilities for future societies, right? Like being in armed struggle radicalizes and pushes 
potentialities and ideas for future societies in a much more liberatory way. Um, and, and I think this is what's going on today. I think the fact that you do see this collaboration across religious and political and ideological lines, they're all working together against the primary contradiction. I think that potentially augurs well for the creation of a more just and an egalitarian society in the future. But a lot of that work happens at the individual level by folks who are risking their lives and they, they get a taste of what that type of, what, like what freedom and liberation means to them in that particular moment as they're engaged in immensely dangerous activities. Is, uh, I, I see one question that is following up for Alex. Uh, I don't know, Alex, if you want to provide a little bit, they're asking for some more sources about the links between the Reef Liberation Struggle in Latin America. I don't know, you mentioned briefly something. I don't know if there is anything you recommend to read. I, I mentioned it in reference to Alberto Valle, who was that Spanish Civil War veteran um, who fought in the Rift War and then fought on the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War in the 30s. So um, that's actually a great question. I wonder if there's got to be some links. Now, now I'm going to be like die, losing myself online for like the next couple of hours. But I don't know especially about that, but I'm sure there are some links. But it was in reference to Alberto Valle and what he learned from fighting in the Rift and then trying to reapply that to Madrid um, against Francoist forces. So I read everything about Alberto Valle, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, I see a question by Mehmet. Uh, I don't know, Justin or Alex, do you feel like going for this? I think it's a little bit... <laughs> this is a little beyond me. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> It'll be beyond everyone here, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's it sounds a little bit too much. But I think you touched upon that, you know, a little bit before. I mean, well, you know, there was that video conference of like Malik Houthi and Hassan Nasrallah and uh, the the president of Iran. I don't know, but I don't know, three, two, three weeks ago. So, I would I would recommend that you want to if you want to talk to all the. If you want to hear from all the religious and that that were all they were all very religious that day. They were all talking lots of religious stuff. So that's where I would that's where I would go. Um, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in Latin America, yeah. I would, but yeah, no, I'm not yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, if uh, I'll just leave two minutes, if anybody wants to raise another question, but I, I have just, uh, I have a, two points. One is uh, if Alex wants to really now, I want to give him the time to to maybe go go back, circle back to the to Israel in Latin America, if he feels like it, uh, to say anything about that. And then I got something for just, but I'll let Alex go first. I'll just say Google uh, my <laughs> article for liberated text or foreign exchanges where I go into detail of all the horrific, this terrible, like horrific uh, strategy, you know, history of, of Israelis in, in, in Latin America. I mean, I think I mentioned that, that they were involved, deeply involved in the, the, Maya, the Mayan genocide in Guatemala in the early 80s. Um, and uh, in Colombia, they helped train the death squads um, that the right wing anti communist death squads that end up becoming pretty powerful drug trafficking organizations on their own. And the history of Colombia and Israel was really tight up until the election of Gustavo Petro. There's a reason why Hugo Chavez referred to Colombia as the Israel of Latin America. And uh, these Colombian presidents would be very proud of that. Like they were really happy that they were being called that. Um, but yeah, I would just, there's, it's, it's a lot. So I would recommend that. And there's a, in those articles, I reference a lot of the really good literature that dealt with this, particularly in the 80s. And somebody's also mentioning your episode on millennials that you did in reference to that. So there you go. Another one. Yeah. Uh, one question, and then I think I want to finish there. I mean, unless anything comes up is, uh, did we, you know, when we talk about the Soviet, uh, when uh, can when we sorry when we think about the the communist exchanges that what we're seeing now in terms of building in Palestine in, of liberated practice, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, I was I was wondering whether uh, I, I, um, because you wrote this fabulous eight piece uh, series in your blog, Justin, about you know the you know Judaism and Zionism and so on and so forth. How do you? count the question of the kibbutzim in that point you know because even that communist idea at that point in history has been then turned into a colonial enterprise 
Yeah, well, okay. So historically, not all socialists were anti-imperialist, right? So in France, uh, Germany, those were socialists that they were out, you know, they, they didn't even really see a contradiction or a problem. They called themselves socialists and they called themselves imperialists. They wanted to colonize Algeria and build uh, socialist communities in, Alger in colonized Algeria. They wanted to build uh, socialist communities and, uh, you know, also have German glory, have Germany's day in the sun so that Germany could have uh, colonies like the other powers that deserve to have colonies. So the idea of like racial supremacy and colonization and colonialism, those were not uh, opposed to socialism before uh, the Russian Revolution before Lenin. So Lenin and, you know, people in that, like it wasn't just Lenin and it wasn't just Russians, but it was like Lenin was the leader of that school of thought where he said, no, like socialists should be anti-imperialist too. That's, uh, we, we we can't, we don't, we don't want to be part of this thing. And, and, and it, that was a big part of why he wrote the book, um, Imperialism, where he kind of read Hobson and he, like took he wanted to take Hobson a little bit further and say actually imperialism is what leads to all of the world war you know the, the it's inevitably leads to to world war so um the kibbutzes are just a part of that the kibbutzes are just uh you know there are different kinds of zionism right zionism is the idea that that it's a racial supremacist idea it's the idea that these european uh, Jews should go and colonize pa Palestine. And it's uh, also, and I, there are different, within that, there are right-wing, there are religious, there are atheists, and there are uh, socialists. And the socialists who believe in the socialist dream in this uh, colon in this colony. So I don't, it's not, it's not really a contradiction. It's actually just a part of imperialist socialism that developed or at the same time as Zionism in the same part of the world. One last question, and I'd like to get both of you, you know, reaction uh, to this, uh, uh, starting with Alex. And I'll read the question because probably not everybody can read it, uh, but... Uh, there is a question by Ori in the chat saying, uh, haven't Israel is imperial sponsor been bullying Iran since after World War II with a break during the installed Shah years with Israel then taking over? In other words, isn't this another example of Western policy of attacking any state that attempts to pursue an independent course? To bring it back to Palestine, isn't Palestine another example which would explain why the US is willing to go so far as to defeat the resistance and will to resist after Alexa flood exposed the spider web, which I think connects Alex. Also, I'd like to hear the your thoughts about you know yes to Marxism, but also the question of national liberation, and at, which at the times comes first, and then you you know how these two contradictions are important in the building of of independence as well. Well, yeah, it, there's. I mean, I think the movements in Latin America don't see it as a contradiction, right? I think they, mm. they see national liberation and, and Marxism as complementary. And Marxism gives them a way to understand the realities that they live in, that they inhabit. I mean, that's the way that, like, um, that's the way that you know, grassroots level revolutionaries or militants will think about it. They'll think, they'll talk about Marxism not in like a doctrinaire or highfalutin theoretical way that we might talk about it, but they would say, this gave me an analytical framework through which to understand things like my poverty, like why am I poor? And, and that then get, allows them to make connections with the more uh, trained or um, uh, prepared uh, Marxist who are leading a lot of these guerrilla movements in the 1960s and 70s, right? And I think, so national liberation and Marxism aren't seen as, as, as a contradictory frame analytical uh, frameworks or demands and i think this is going back to the question about liberation theology liberation theology then provides like a cohesive glue of both and specific, specifically in central america because the way that the grassroots will understand marxism is through liberation theology they will read acts of the apostles and think hey wh why can't we live like that right but it all starts with a really simple question why are we poor and if the answer is 
if the answer is not because God destined us to be poor, then that leads to all sorts of like create like critical and political interrogations. And this is why liberation theology becomes such an important like ideological glue and bridge between you know middle class students and professors and intellectuals who are Marxists and who led these movements and the masses that 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 made up the movement. Um, so and and national so national liberation and liberation theology become really important ideological bridges to Marxism and there's very little contradiction. I mean, and, and, I, and I think that's the way that, this is one of the reasons why, especially in Central America, some of the, in El Salvador and Nicaragua, especially, why these movements were so successful in recruiting mass popular support. Justin? Uh, I think if I understand what you're getting at, it's like, um, okay, you're a Marxist and the axis of resistance and the way they talk about God all the time makes you a little uncomfortable. That kind, It's that kind of thing. It's like Marxists don't have those same beliefs. And like, um, so how do we not be sectarian about this? And I, I think for me, it's like, I'm a, you know, as someone who I just, I read history and I, I just think like, I like Marxism. I don't... Um, I don't, I think there are certain things you just can't explain otherwise, <laughs> and they're big, important things. So, you know, you, you have to read it, but like, I don't, I don't see, um, you know, what Marx called like primitive communism. I see the, the struggle between imperialism and like specifically Anglo imperialism and like the specific kind of genocidal Protestant Anglo capitalist imperialism of which Zionism is absolutely a part. I I don't see that struggle as, um, I see that struggle as going on before Marx started writing, I guess, is where I'm, where I'm going. And Marx can help you analyze even the things that happened before Marx started writing and the things that happened after. So like, it's not, um, it's a set of, it's a set of analytical tools that are so, that are fundamental to understanding society and, and, and economy and, and, and what's happening in the world. But it's not, a, it's not like, it's not like you can't get to some of those insights without reading that text. So like, I think that a lot of what, um we see in in terms of like Yemen's agricultural system or what Palestinians do in their liberated spaces is very uh communist I don't know if you want to call it like primitive communism or but it's not primitive because they've got advanced missiles and all kinds of other uh tool social media and and all kinds of sophistication so i just don't i i guess i would just argue that marxists need to if they haven't already and probably lots of them do need to just uh understand these concepts as like you know marx brought together a, a series of really important concepts and insights but like those insights are dispersed among society and uh and you can find them outside of those books as well I think also, uh, Mateo, we also have to, the people who are, because I think that's what I read in your question too, what Justin just mentioned, and we have to, um, the people who, particularly in the global north, who, who consider themselves Marxists, but are feel uncomfortable with all the God talk, I think we have to determine if they're like engaging in this question in good faith or bad faith, because I feel like some of these people are completely politically useless and they're bad faith in this in this debate and they're using it as a cudgel to say we are the good responsible leftists and you guys are the para paraglider leftists who are doing so much harm to the movement in the united states i mean they're in a way they're repeating what justin mentioned about the second international and like some of these socialist movements in europe before the russian revolution um so i think we need to determine like are they engaging in this in good faith or bad faith and, and most of the stuff that I've seen in the US is from bad faith leftists who are making really like just bullshit politically useless arguments. And they're doing it to, po to position themselves in relation to, you know, uh, politics of respectability on the left. 
but that are completely useless outside of the global north and they're ignored and they have a very specific audience in the US that could then get you, you know, uh, print space in um, Haaretz or The Guardian or, uh, you know, whatever, The Atlantic. But I, I, I think we need to like determine like, is this a good faith question or is it, or is it people engaged in, in bad faith, bad faith argumentation? Um, and I just realized I'm using faith and that that's also like no pun intended, but you, you know what I'm getting at. I, I mean, uh, I was actually kindly trying to push in that direction. I wanted to hear your thoughts. I mean, really, because I think there is a crisis when it comes to to the Marxist movement uh, in uh, in the West, which, you know, it allowed me to touch on some of the points that I will be talking about next week, which is the heterogeneity of struggles that we need to keep in mind. But I wanted to hear exactly from you, from uh, on 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 a, on one of the points that I think is very important for us to understand, which you know, it's this capacity of uh, you know of using Marxism as a tool of analysis, but at the same time also understanding the material conditions on from which these struggles come out, you know, emerge. So we it, it's it's important I think for us to we are faced I think at this historical moment with a question that uh, the the Western left has a lot of problems in. Uh, in uh, in articulating in a manner that is supportive. It always has, Matteo. <laughs> I don't think this okay. Is I, so <laughs> so it's also it's also like uh, I also Good don't point. think Marx isn't necessarily like the best role model for this because there was a famous uh, letter that Mirza Ghalib, a, a poet from India, oh. pro independence poet from India, wrote to him, and he he wrote him a letter and said something like, you know greetings whatnot um and you know may god be with you and and marx was like please don't mention god <laughs> like, for, come on marx yeah. like why do you have to be so cranky all the time every letter to every single person you know i think he got less cranky in his older year like at, right Maybe. before he left um like especially his letters to like the russians i think he that was less cranky than he was i don't know when he sent this letter justin but yeah, he was. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, comrades, guys, I think uh, I think we can close down here unless you have any thoughts you still want to share about uh, the, you know, the fabrications of the Western left. But I think we can keep that for another time. Uh, <laughs> Justin, that's Galib. That's Galib uh, and Marx in case you guys wanted to uh, see. Oh, if I'm... oh, don't uh, let me share it with everybody. Oh, there you go. Yes. Uh, Alex, Justin, thank you so much again for this uh, wonderful talks and lectures and the possibility to exchange important thoughts and making connection of, about Palestine about and the entire world and the struggle that we are all facing uh, together. I want just to, before closing completely, I want to say that we're, there, is, there are two more lectures. One, it's happening next Friday uh, on uh, at seven o'clock Palestine time, uh, it's going to be myself and Nina Farnia. We're going to be talking about the axis of resistance, as well as the question of uh, you know multipolarity and uh, and what is the situation of the U.S. right now, U.S. imperialism, to understand what you know potentially what's happening also in the U.S. in relation to Palestine. And then we're going to close with uh, an interview with Dr. Saif Dana the week after, but the date is not confirmed yet. We will we will be providing. Keep following us on the YouTube channel, Middle East Critique, Middle East Critique on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Justin and Alex. And uh, we will upload this lecture very soon in the coming days. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. One, two.